Well, we are in session five. The next three chapters are going to chronicle the three primary sins of King Saul, sins that ultimately cost him the kingdom. Here's a guy that had everything going for him, good friends, good stature. His heart seemed to be in the right place, certainly at the beginning, and yet he blew it. You want to understand why. And of course, the chapter that follows these will be the anointing of, of David. But in any case, as far as chapter 13 is concerned, obviously just a little bit of review before we start to set the stage here. Um, we're obviously in the time of the monarchy and uh, Saul, David, and Solomon and following. And we have uh, Samuel is the bridge from the, he's, he's the last of the uh, judges, if you will. Saul, David, Solomon, then the kingdom divides in the civil war and, uh, and each one goes into uh, an exile. We have uh, first, second Samuel covering us, first Samuel up through the end of Saul, Second Samuel, David, first, second Kings, the Solomon and the division and Chronicles will uh, go ahead and uh, repeat the second Samuel to the end of second Kings from the point of view of the Southern kingdom specifically. So that's the quick profile of what we're going to be following through on. First book of Samuel, we've talked about uh, Samuel himself and his beginnings. We've talked about Saul and he had his appointment as king and he, he's uh, had a very promising beginning and yet he's going to start stumbling. We'll watch that. And then, of course, David will come, who's the greatest. He's going to be replaced. Saul's going to be replaced by the most famous king that's ever been on the planet Earth. Saving, of course, Jesus Christ. Samuel 13, 1 Samuel 13, Saul's impatience. Now, it's interesting. Uh, the time had now come for Israel to gather at Gilgal. Uh, Saul and Samuel had agreed some months before, back from chapter 10, if you recall. And uh, 1 Samuel 13, verse 1, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned uh, two years over Israel, it goes on. Now, this is a problem verse, by the way. What the Hebrew literally says, it says, Saul was blank years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years over Israel. Now, it's got a lot of problems translationally with that, because uh, it seems as if a figure is dropped out of the first part of the statement. The second part cannot mean that he reigned a total of two years, obviously. The Old Testament chronology implies, and Paul in his address uh, at Antioch in Acts 13 uh, distinctly teaches that Saul reigned for 40 years. That's probably a round off number, but probably close to the actual one. And the text is very difficult to translate. Your NIV will says that Saul was 30 years old when he began the king and he reigned over Israel 42 years. That's the way they've taken the liberty to translate that. And many scholars following Oregon and some of the other church fathers postulate there was 30 in here. And that's the way the NIV did it. But in any case, Several of these passages, you'll discover the text in 1 Samuel may have suffered somewhat in transmission. In any case, uh, Saul apparently has reigned for a while. It, apparently when he's reigned two years after Israel, we have this narrative picked up. Verse 2, Saul chose him 3,000 men of Israel, whereof 2,000 were with Saul and Michmash and uh, Mount Bethel, and uh, 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. And uh, so, see, he... he uh, began to select and train a regular army rather than rely on the militias that uh, uh, he had uh, used previously. And he apparently learned from the recent experience of the Ammonites, and he, so he created a standing army of 3,000 troops, 2,000 with him, and then 1,000 under his son Jonathan. And uh, they're stationed at Michmash and Gibeah, uh, respectively. Now, here's, this gives you a rough feeling of Israel at the time, starting going from north to south to the east. We have the the Arameans, the Bashan, Ammon, Moab, and Edom. To the south, we have the Amorites, Kenites, and Malachites. But uh, we'll, we'll zero in on the general area we're going to be dealing with just to familiarize ourselves with it. We're going to hear a lot about uh, Michmash, Bethel, and Gibeah to give you a rough feeling where these are. A little north of Jerusalem with Bethel more to the west. And uh, we won't go through all the cities. We'll take those as we go. But to give you a rough feeling of the geography. And Jonathan smote the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, or Gibeon in effect, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard say that Saul had smitten the garrison of the Philistines, and that Israel was, uh, also was, uh, had an abomination with the Philistines, and the people were called together after Saul to Gilgal. Uh, I want you to notice, of course, that he's taking credit for all this stuff, for his son's victory in effect. He wants to try and impress the people and get them to follow him. The Philistines gathered together to fight with Israel. 30,000 chariots is what the text says. The scholars are a little skeptical about that. I'll come back to that. 
30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and pitched in Michmash uh, eastward from Beth Aven. The Hebrew reads 30,000 chariots, but that was a little problematic in the minds of most even conservative scholars because that would mean you have five chariots for each horseman. Three, 30,000 and 3,000 in Hebrew look very, very similar. So some people think there's a copyist error here. There's a number of aspects to the, uh, to the, uh, the Samuel text that suggest that it may have gotten uh, lost something in, in the transmission. So m most scholars suspect that it's really 3,000 3, chariots. is a lot of chariots and uh, 6,000 horsemen and so on. So anyway, this is the first of Israel's three major battles with the Philistines during Saul's reign. Uh, we'll have some here and in 17 and then in chapter 31 again. Anyway, when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people hid themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and high places and pits. You can imagine. By the way, you really understand, it'll come up later in the text, but the, the, the Philistines were not only large in number and well-trained and well-armed, they also had a monopoly on iron. That was a technology they had a leading edge of. And so that's a terrifying thing from a weapons technology point of view. So some of the Hebrews went over the Jordan, that is over to the East Bank, if you will, to the land of Gad and Gilead. And as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, which is right on the, right virtually on the Jordan River, virtually. And all the people followed him trembling. He tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. So Saul's getting panicky because Samuel's supposed to show up, and he hasn't shown up. And uh, that's getting him pretty upset. See, he's, a, he's, in a, he's in a jam because the longer he waits, the more dangerous his position becomes. And if he, were, if, uh, if he were to strike immediately, he might be able to defeat the enemy, but his delay would only make his enemy stronger as the Philistines are gathering closer and closer, uh, moving eastward across the country. And so he waited for, for uh, Samuel, and Samuel doesn't show up, so Saul makes a big mistake. He offers the public sacrifice himself as king. That's a no-no. On the seventh day, Samuel does come and... and uh, it's going to be bad news. So Saul says in verse 9, uh, bring thither the burnt offering to me and peace offerings. And he, he offered the burnt offering. You may not appreciate this, but see, Saul is making a huge mistake here because the king is not to intrude on the priest's office. It came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might salute him or actually, you know, or receive a blessing in effect. We're going to discover in the following verses that he's going to make all kinds of excuses to try to put the blame either on Samuel or the people. And uh, so, uh, but Samuel, of course, doesn't buy all this. This is the beginning of the end for Saul. If God couldn't trust him on the little matters, how could he put, trust him with the kingdom is the question that it begs in effect. Verse 11, and Samuel said, what hast thou done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me and that thou camest not within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered themselves together at Michmash. Therefore said I, the Philistines will come down upon me to Gilgal, and I have not made, if I have not made supplication to the Lord, I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. In other words, Saul, you blew it big time. You know, as we, as we see these things, and we, even if we have a tendency to be a little sympathetic to Saul because he was in a military situation under attack, God means what he says and says what he means. And this is sort of distant to us because it's a long time ago and it's a very special circumstances we don't necessarily relate to, but let's at least extract that very key insight. God says what he means and means what he says. And God is a God of details. And we're going to see that come up again and again and again. When Abraham moves the Ark of the Covenant with good intentions, gets a guy killed because he didn't follow directions. It's supposed to be on the shoulders of the Levites, not on some cart. And that'll be coming up, obviously, later in the day. It, it, it points, again and again, we realize that God takes himself seriously. Samuel continues, But now thy kingdom shall not con continue, or what he really means endure forever. It will continue for a while. But it will not endure. It's really is a more precise way of translating it, probably. The, uh, your kingdom will not endure the way the NIV deals with it. It's probably a little closer to the concept here. But see, Saul's dynasty will come to an end. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. See, God in his own mind has someone in mind. Who is that? David. David. Going to be the most famous king in human history, past and future. Christ, of course, being accepted. 
Astonishing. Now you say, gee, God's a little severe on Saul here. You have to measure this in light of God's holiness. Just remember the instance of the, the careless handling of the Ark of the Covenant at Beth Shemesh. Remember when the Philistines returned from the Philistines. They violated the holy standards and, and God judged them. And here Saul also, he disobeyed the law of Moses, Leviticus 6, and the word of the prophet Samuel in 1 Samuel 10. So he, both the words of the prophet and the words of the law back in Leviticus. Followed them both. And God takes that seriously. Samuel rose and got him up from Gilgal unto Gibeah of Benjamin. And Saul numbered the people that were present with him, about 600 men. <laughs> Saul and Jonathan his son and the people that were present with him abode in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped in Michmash. And spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned to the way that led to Ophrah, that's to the north in the land of Jeol. Another company turned the way of Beth Horon, which to the west. Another company turned to the way of the border that looketh to the valley of Zeboim in the wilderness. In other words, going east, east of the Jordan. And to give you a rough feeling for this, the Philistines are based at Michmash. They sent some to the north, some to the west, and uh, some to the east. But the Philistines there are important. But you realize how far east they are. The Philistines are normally associated with the southeastern region of the country, Ashdod, Ashkelon, and the five famous five cities that we've studied so much lately. Now, they're really all the way to Michmash. Saul is primarily based at Gilgal, which isn't that far away, 30 miles away. Now, there's no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. What that means, a metal worker. In other words, they did not have, they did not, the Philistines did not permit the Israelis to have iron workers. That was a proprietary technology. The Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make themselves sword or spears. But all the Israels went down to Philistines to sharp each man his share, his culture, his axe, his matic. They, they had some tools. They were allowed some tools, but they had to have them sharpened by the specialists. See, that, that was obviously a big disadvantage in wartime because that wouldn't be available to them in wartime. It, they apparently, the Philistines apparently had sophisticated metallurgical skills that they got from the Hittites or other Anatolian peoples that uh, when they came in contact as part of the Sea People's migration from the Aegean Sea uh, to Canaan about 1200 BC, about several hundred years, a couple of centuries beforehand. And, but yet they had a file for the mattocks and for the coulters and for the forks and for the axes to sharpen the goats. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and Jonathan, his son, there were found. In other words, Saul and Jonathan, probably a few privileged, did have swords and spears, but that's, you know, that's uh, uh, a... a uh, Almost an underground uh, uh, capability, because that was uh, the Philistines uh, controlled that. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Mishmash. Now we get to chapter 14, and uh, we're going to deal with Saul's pride. But there's an event that occurs in chapter 14 that is really incredibly instructive for you and I. Uh, we're going to focus a little bit on Saul's son, Jonathan. This guy's a good guy. He becomes a very close friend of David, obviously, later. But now it came to pass upon a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said unto the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he told not his father. Saul tarried in the uttermost part of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is Migron, and the people that were with him were about 600 men. But this is a little venture that Jonathan, his son, and, a, and his buddy, or his armor bearer, are going to do on their own. Ahiah, the son of Ahitab, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people knew not that Jonathan was gone. The priest is going to be important later on in the narrative. But anyway, and between the passages, between these hills, these cliffs, between the passages by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on the one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozaz, and the name of the other was Sine. The forefront of the one was situate northward over against Michmash, and the other southward over Gibeah. So there's a narrow, relatively narrow canyon here, apparently. And Jonathan said to the young man that bear his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. I want you to understand the guts of this guy. The Philistine-trained army is up there, and he's there with his armor bearer. There's a couple of, you know, venturesome youth. And um, hey, let's go over and see what we can do to these guys. These two guys against the Philistine army, whatever numbers, the th thousands, whatever. And uh, 
So it may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And Jonathan's saying to the guy, hey, we don't know what the Lord's going to do. Let's, let's find out. <laughs> and uh, give you a feeling where that is, that there's Michmash and give you Michmash to the north and give you the south. They're between those two, in effect. Zarbar said unto him, do all that is in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I am with thee according to thy heart. This guy, this young armor bearer, is, he's up for it. Hey, you call it. I'm with you. You lie and I'll swear to it kind of thing. Okay. Then said Jonathan, behold, we will pass over unto these men and we will discover ourselves to them. That's old English for saying we're going to reveal ourselves. We're going to, yeah, we're going to go there and we're going to let them see us. But they're going to do it in a way that they can use it like what we would call a fleece or a, sort of a signal, see? If they say thus unto us, tarry until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up unto us, then we will go up, and the Lord hath delivered them in our hand. This will be a sign unto us. Do you get what they're doing? Gutsy. There's just the two of them. But they're going to encounter a sentry or whatever, or, or a garrison group. And both of them discovered themselves into the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews come forth out of the holes wherewith they had hid themselves. And the men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor bearer, said, Come up to us, and we will show you a thing. <laughs> and Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. So Jonathan took that response as a sign from God that the day was theirs. And so... <laughs> These two guys, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and up on his feet and his armor bearer after him. Notice where he's at. He's up front. And they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew after him. And that first slaughter with Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within, as it were, a half an acre of land, which a yoke of oxen might plow. In other words, it's a fairly narrow area. There were 20 guys they slaughtered. The two of these kids. That's kind of fun. <laughs> And there was trembling in the host, in the field, and among all the people. And the garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked. So it was a very great trembling. So there's, there's something supernatural going on here. This is, you know, they're trembling, of course, they're scared. But even the earth, there's an earthquake. So the Philistines are rattled, literally, okay? And the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah and Benjamin looked and said, Behold, the multitude melted away, and they went down, went on beating down one another. This heroic encounter, of course, has... Uh, uh, shocked and frightened the Philistines. But Saul's own lookouts could tell something was going on because the enemy was starting to run. So he knew Saul knew something was up and uh, he knew that it somehow must involve some Israelis. So he takes a muster to find out who's missing. <laughs> the only one missing is his son, Jonathan, and the armor bearer. So Saul said on the people that were with him, number now and see who's gone from us. And when they had numbered, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahiah, that's the priest, Bring hither the ark of God. For the ark of God was at the time with the children of Israel. In fact, the uh, ark was uh, at Kiriath Jerim. And uh, it's a symbol, of course, the presence of the Lord. But here it's being summoned by Saul into battle. It came to pass while Saul talked unto the priest that the noise that was in the host of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said to the priest, Withdraw thine hand. Now what's implied here is the priest was starting to use the urm and the thummim to find out God's will. But Saul said, don't bother. I know it's, you know, God's clearly delivered the day for us. You have to have a little more context to get the feeling of it. That's really what's implied uh, there by verse 19. And Saul and all the people that were with him assembled themselves and they came to the battle. Behold, every man's sword was against his fellow and there was a very great discomfiture. Moreover, the Hebrews that were with the Philistines before that time, which went up with them into the camp from the country round about, even they also turned to be with the Israelites that were with Saul and Jonathan. In other words, there were some indigenous Israelites that turned to join the the, the national interest here, if you will. And likewise, all the men of Israel which had hid themselves in Mount Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over to Beth Avon. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying... Now, by the way, they had this huge victory. This huge victory. They, they, round, they really, in effect, roused the nation by all this. All triggered by Jonathan and his armor bearer, in effect. But Saul does a, a, a tragic thing here because he ends up what in effect is like a vow. 
Men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies. So none of the people tasted any food. That there was a, he's proclaiming a fast. Which, by the way, is pretty stupid in battle conditions. These guys are moving, covering ground, uh, all this. You know, they need to be nourished, not play some, you know, a ritual game here. And when the people were coming to the wood, behold, the honey dropped, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan heard not when his father charged the people with the oath. Therefore, he put forth the end of his rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth and his eyes were enlightened. In other words, he, he was nourished. He, 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 he regained his awareness. He was, he was famished like everybody else. And he took a little honey. Then answered one of the people and said, Thy father straightly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food this day. And the people were faint. Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened because I tasted a little of the honey. And uh, how much more, if happily the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found. For had there not been uh, now much greater slaughter among the Philistines, we would have been done better if we were more on our toes, in other words, better nourished, etc. And they smote the Philistines that day from Michmash to Agilon, and the people were very faint. Now to give you some feeling for this, Michmash is where the Philistines were, all the way to Agilon. That's well towards the west coast. Agilon, Beth Horon, the city just to the north, you, should be, you probably will remember in Joshua 10, that's where the, Joshua had his famous battle. Or the sun stood still, the moon was in the valley of Agilon, and so forth. Very famous uh, uh, issue there. But anyway, from Mishmash, uh, literally over half, uh, halfway across the country, these guys are exhausted. The people flew upon the spoil and took sheep and oxen and calves and slew them on the ground, and the people did eat them with the blood. Now, here's another big mistake. In their haste to eat, they're not draining the blood. And that's violating the Torah. And that's considered really really bad news. And Leviticus 17 deals with it. And that's really even, that's considered even worse than breaking the vow of the king. And so uh, they did eat with the blood. And then, then they told Saul saying, behold, the people sin against the Lord in that they eat with the blood. And he said, ye have transgressed, roll a great stone unto me this day. And Saul said, disperse yourselves among the people and say to them, bring me hither every man his ox and every man his sheep and slay them here and eat and sin not against the Lord in eating with the blood. And all the people brought every man his ox with him that night and slew them there. And Saul built an altar to the Lord, same as the first altar that he built unto the Lord. And Saul said, let's go down after the Philistines by night and spoil them until morning light. Let's not leave a man of them. And they said, do whatever seemeth good unto thee. And then said the priest, let us draw hither unto God. And Saul asked counsel of God, shall I go down after the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them to the hand of Israel? But he answered him, not that day. God is start, you're starting to see the curtain close on Saul's situation. Saul said, draw ye near hither all the chief of the people and know and see wherein this sin hath been this day. For as the Lord liveth, which saveth Israel, though it be in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there's not a young man among all the people that answered him. Then said he unto all Israel, be on one side, and I and Jonathan, my son, will be on the other side. The people said to Saul, do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said unto the Lord God of Israel, give a perfect lot. Uh, or In other words, sh uh, show the innocent, what he's going to try to say. Saul and Jonathan were taken, and the people escaped. Saul said, cast the lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what thou hast done. And Jonathan told him, and he said, I did but taste a little honey with the end of my rod that was in mine hands, uh, so I must die. Saul answered, God do so and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. This is Saul. We're seeing another side of Saul here, aren't we? The people said unto Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? God forbid. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he died not. In other words, the people intervened, wouldn't let Saul kill his son. So Saul went up from following the Philistines. The Philistines went to their own place. Saul took over the kingdom of Israel, fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the children of Ammon, against Edom, against the kings of Zorah, Zorah, that's east, yeah, eastward, and against the Philistines. And whithersoever he turned himself, he vexed them. And he gathered a host and smote the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled him. Now, if you take a look at this, of course, we have Moab, Ammon, Edom, and Amalekites as the major players 
Ammon, Moab, and Edom to the east, which are today that region we would call Jordan, and uh, Amalekites uh, to the southwest. Now there's a little background before we close this chapter. Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan and Ishui and Melchishua, and the names of his two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn Merab and the name of the younger Michael. Michael will end up being the first wife of uh, David. And the name of Saul's wife, who was Ahinoam, and the daughter uh, Ahimaaz, and the name of the captain of his host was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. And this phrase causes some scholars a lot of problems because uh, you need to understand the genealogy. Abiel had the son Ner, and Ner had the son Kish, and the son of Kish was Saul. Ner also had a son by the name of Abner. Abner was actually Saul's uncle, not his son. And that verse is, mis especially in the English translation, when it says Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Abner, yes, he's the son of Ner, but he's also the son's uncle isn't a, a modifier of Ner, it's of Abner. Follow me? Small point, but causes some confusion. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. In other words, in other, saying another way that we would say it is that Abner was his uncle. Anyway, there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took, uh, took them unto him. So Saul is strengthening his, his forces. Now, before we get into the next chapter, it'll have a lot more, you'll be confused by it. Unless you, I'm going to call next the next chapter, chapter 15, Saul's disobedience. But to understand it, we need to um, have a little background. So we're going to remind ourselves of what happened back there in Exodus 17, way right back in the days of Moses. Exodus 17, for those of you following your own Bibles. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel at Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. It came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. When he got tired, he let his hands down. Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they, took, <laughs> and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon. <laughs> and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hand, the one on the one side, the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. In other words, they noticed that as long as Moses' hands up, they're winning. But he couldn't, he hold, you, know, just, you just hold your hands up so long. So his two buddies, you know, Aaron and, and her, you know, <laughs> keep things going. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. He didn't do it then. They prevailed in the battle, but didn't kill them all. But God is committed here to put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And we're going to come back to that, see? Moses built an altar and called the name of the altar Jehovah Nissi, or Jehovah Nissi, and, uh, which means the Lord my banner. For he said, because the Lord hath sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. That's the commitment in the Torah in Exodus 17. Verse 46. Now let's shift from Exodus to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 25, where Moses says, Remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, even all that were feeble behind thee, when thou was faint and weary, for he feared not God. In other words, the Amalekites were knocking off the rear, the slow movers of the nation as they were coming out of the Exodus. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, thou shalt not forget it. This is in the Torah, twice in effect, Exodus, now Deuteronomy. Now with that background, we're going to move ahead in the time of Samuel and pick up Saul here. 1 Samuel 15, verse 1, Samuel said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go, Samuel talking to, to Saul, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox, sheep, camel, and ass. Boy, that's pretty severe stuff. 
A lot of people get troubled by that, but that's what God is telling Samuel to instruct Saul. Saul gathered the people together, numbered them in Talim, and uh, 200,000 footmen, that's a bunch, and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Malachites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Malachites. So this is a tribe that's also, you know, it's a pagan tribe, but you guys get out of here. This judgment's coming, so to speak. And Saul smote the Malachites, Mahabalah, until thou comest ashore that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Malachites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the oxen, and of the fatlings, and of the lambs, and all that was good, that would, and would not utterly destroy them. But everything that was vile and refused, that they destroyed utterly. Well, guys, you're not doing what he said, right? But the word of the Lord came unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried to the Lord all night long. By the way, I might mention about the Kenites. I meant to, I knew there's a couple things I want to bring out. Uh, the, the Kenites had shown uh, kindness to Israel in the wilderness wandering, which is why they were spared. But something else you might just want to tuck away, Jethro. Remember Jethro? Was a Kenite. He was a Kenite, just as an aside. Kind of interesting. So it's clear anyway, Saul has really blown this because uh, he really kept the best sheep and cattle and so forth to enhance his own glory and prestige by bringing back the king as a prisoner. And uh, he couldn't resist uh, returning with public, you know, public exhibits of his, of his uh, leadership. And th this is going to become clear when we get to verse 12 that he planned to, in effect, put a monument in his honor. He was really on a, he was on an ego kick here. But uh, Samuel, of course, is... Uh, is really grieved by all of this. So we go on. When Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel. By the way, that's not Carmel up on the coast. That's a, there's another Carmel down in Judah, and that's the one I'm talking about. The Carmel that's up by Haifa is quite a ways from where we We're dealing further in, in the south here. This is, there happens to be another town called Carmel. It causes some confusion. Anyway, Saul came to Carmel and said, Behold, he set him up a place and gone about and passed on and and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. That's Saul's version, okay? Look at me, you see, I've done it, right? Samuel said, Well, what meaneth then this, the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, <laughs> and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? <laughs> I, uh, the animals are giving him away, obviously. And uh, Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. They, those guys, not me, those guys. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we've utterly destroyed. So Saul's trying to pin this rose on the, on the people or the leadership, see? So uh, it isn't going to fly, of course. And uh, he's also going to argue in a, a couple of verses later that uh, they were brought because of the insistence of the soldiers. He's going to try, he's going to try to pin this like any good bureaucrat, he's trying to, he's fleeing accountability here. Then Samuel said to Saul, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. He said to him, stay on. Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribe of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord hath sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Malachites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then, didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Samuel said, uh, Saul said to Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Malachi, and have utterly destroyed the Malachites. But the people took of the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, and the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord in Gilgal. Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Key point, key principle I'm about to announce here. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. To hearken is better than the fat of the rams. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. I think Samuel continues, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, 
and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Boy, that's scary. That's scary. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You know, when you say it that way, it sounds abstract and theological. The word for witchcraft is the same Hebrew word as divination. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. Rebellion can take the form of thinking you can predict the future better than God can. You see, rebellion can be simply self-will. And when you realize that, this all starts to pinch a bit. It's no longer some curious historical record. There's some issues here for you and I. Hath the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, Samuel emphasizes. For rebellion is, the sin, is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, get this, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Boy, it isn't going to happen in the next verse, but it's going to happen. Just as God told Adam and Eve, you shall surely die. Maybe not in the next 24 hours, but they obviously were subject to death. So Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me that I might worship the Lord. Saul has substituted the saying for the doing. He's given excuses instead of confessions and sacrifice for obedience. So he's very slow in, in doing this. And, and uh, so Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with thee. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Boy, these are heavy words. See, this whole issue with the Amalekites is heavy stuff, serious stuff. As Samuel turned about to go away, Saul laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent, it torn. In other words, Samuel started to leave, and Saul grabs his mantle, and it tears. And Samuel takes that as a sign. Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And who is that? One of the sons of Jesse, that we're going to discover in the next chapter. That leads to a whole other saga. Also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent. He is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet honor me now, I pray thee, before the elders of my people, before Israel, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshiped the Lord. So at least he's got a public facade here for the people for a while. But then Samuel's not finished. And said, Samuel, bring hither to me Agag, the king of the Malachites. And Agag came unto him delicately. I like that, King James, delicately. <laughs> Agag said, surely the bitterness of death is past. Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. So Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. Boy, Samuel didn't mess around. Then Samuel went to Ramah. That's way eastward on the other side of the Jordan. And Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king of over Israel. Heavy words. Is there a mistake in the Bible? I think there's one in verse 35. It says, Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Does anyone see a problem with that? I think he did. We're going to see that occur in the event that occurs with the witch of Endor. Because Samuel shows up and says, Saul, tomorrow you're going to be with me. And Saul was. We'll get to all that. But in any case, 1 Samuel 16. This is the, really the beginning of the next section. It's the story of David, but just the beginning of it. Oh, by the way, before we leave the, uh, that, that chapter, there is, it's a, you get the impression that all the Amalekites were killed. That's not quite true. There apparently is a descendant of Agag that also was spared, not mentioned in the text. 
he will show up in the book of Esther. His name is Haman. If Saul had done what God had told him to do, the book of Esther would not have been necessary. The plot of Haman, sort of a, you know, a, a, an earlier Hitler, tried to wipe out all the Jews in the Persian Empire. And he, may, he got the decree signed. The whole saga of Esther deals with that. The, the, the villain of the piece, of course, is Haman, who is a descendant of Agag, the king that Saul was supposed to have killed. And didn't. Samuel, of course, did. But there's apparently somehow a descendant of the son that, because he shows up in the book of Esther. The hero of the book of Esther is Mordecai, who is a descendant of a guy that David spared. It's interesting that whole, the whole book of Esther is really the convergence of two people that one that was supposed to have been killed that wasn't, and one that was threatened to be killed that David spared. And they become the hero and the villain of the book of Esther. It's interestingly enough. But let's get back to chapter 16, see if we can get this behind us. The Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he'll kill me. The Lord said, Take an heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. <laughs> the Lord gives him his cover story. <laughs> and call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spoke, and came to Bethlehem. Why would he come to Bethlehem? Because that's the region of Ruth and Boaz. The thing that links Bethlehem to the house of David is the book of Ruth, by the way. And in the last chapter of the book of Ruth is a prophecy that David would be king. Interestingly enough. But moving on. And the elders of the town trembled at his coming. Said, comest thou peaceably? They're all shook up. Samuel is not just some kind of preacher. I mean, he slaughtered a king. He, he, this guy doesn't mess around. So they're all trembling. What's, what's next? What's going on here? Maybe they've heard about the tensions between Samuel and Saul. Who knows? He come peaceably. He says, yes, I come peaceably. I come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. This is one of apparently his oldest, handsomest sons. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance nor the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as a man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Boy, I wish we could do that. You know, guys, uh, we, we generally have a pr pretty clumsy at that. But because we are, that's why God's given us our wives. Have you ever noticed how women have the gift of discernment? As an executive, I've, I've served on a dozen public boards of directors. I've been in a lot of corporate organizations. I wish earlier in my career I'd read the more sensitive to man's instincts. On a number of occasions, I would get involved with somebody that really was presentable, great resume, sounded great, looked great, only to find out later be, be incredibly disappointed and also to discover that Nan had her concerns from the beginning, not for any tangible, objective reason. She just knew. Watch out for that guy. No one can be more easily conned than another salesman. And I'm a salesman, so I'm easily conable, it turns out. Anyway, moving back to the text here. Um, Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And again, Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen these. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. You know, it's interesting. He's the eighth. What's the eighth, the number of? Everybody in music knows that. It's a new octave, right? It's a new beginning, right? There remaineth yet the youngest. Behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send him and fetch him. We will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ready and with all a beautiful countenance and goodly to look at. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. 
Now, don't presume that they understood what this really meant. You see, this is very important, major milestone. But I would suspect even David had no idea what's going on here. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So the Spirit of the Lord is on David, taken from Saul. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. This isn't just a mood, by the way. This isn't just that he's got a downer and he needs some music. This is a supernatural oppression he's got, and it's interesting to see God's remedy for this. Let our Lord now command thy servants which are before thee to seek out a man who is a cunning player on a harp, and it shall come to pass when the evil spirit from God is upon thee that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well and bring him to me. And then answered one of his servants and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning in playing, and a mighty valiant man, a man of war, and prudent in matters. And, uh, and, and that's really prudent in words. Apparently he wrote poetry and stuff. And a, a comely person, and the Lord is with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread and a bottle of wine and a kid and sent them by David his son unto Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, for he became his armor bearer. So things are going swimmingly up front. Up front. And Saul sent, sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took a harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. And so that is the close of chapter 16. It's really the first chapter of the next section, which is the beginning of David. We're going to have the rest of this book, 1 Samuel, will be an overlay of the decline of Saul and the beginning of David. David will be around, but he's not he doesn't really take over, obviously, until Saul passes away. There's some very tense, dramatic moments. There's some incredible uh, things forthcoming in the subsequent chapters, not the least of which, of course, is the famous engagement between David and Goliath. And there's even some surprises in that for many of you, maybe, uh, some things that most people have, have missed. So we will deal with that in uh, forthcoming. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. It's really instructive for us to take to heart the career of Saul. Setting aside for the moment the theocracy and the, the kingship of Israel, of course, which is a key issue here, but here's a guy that was called to the Lord, had everything going for him, and started off well, humble, didn't take himself seriously, showed promise at the beginning. And God was going for him. He had good friends, had good counsel, and he fell. And there, but for the grace of God, go every one of us. Every one of us. When he starts to rely on his own skill and his own power and the tangible uh, aspects of his, of his career, he bungles it first modestly through impatience, then pride, and ultimately by overt disobedience and disregard of God's word. Boy, we need to take that to heart. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the many lessons. We thank you, Father, that you have given us such illumination, not just of Saul, but, and not just of David, but of our King, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that he went before us. And we thank you, Father, that he took care of all our shortcomings and failures. And we thank you, Father, that our history, whatever it is, is resolved in him, in his shed blood. And yet, Father, we would ask that through your Holy Spirit and through your word, you would help us do better in the days ahead. Help us, Father, to keep from grieving you. We come before your throne, Father, with our sins, which are many, our sins of ingratitude as we so inadequately acknowledge and recognize your handiwork, especially your handiwork on our behalf, personally, each of us. And Father, we also acknowledge our presumption, how often we feel we can handle it rather than to kneel in prayer 
before your throne every day. Help us, Father, to take every thought captive that we might walk in a way that will please you, that we might be more effective stewards of the opportunities you've provided each of us. And Father, we also bring before you not just ourselves, but we bring forth our families. You know our needs, Father. Be they medical, financial, whatever, we know that we have no need that you're not aware of. We do pray, Father, for sensitivity. We do pray, Father, that the lessons in all these things not be wasted. But Father, we also bring before you our community and our nation with all its sins. We recognize, Father, that it's not the sins of the pagan left that are standing in the way of what you want to do. It's the sins in the body of Christ. So, Father, we would ask you and your sovereignty to show yourself strong and mighty by giving us a revival in this land. And let it begin with us, Father, each of us. Illuminate that path before us. Highlight for each of us the sins that are offending you, that we might bring them to your throne and confess them. For we know, Father, you're faithful and just then to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we might be more effectual for your purposes as we commit ourselves this night without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.